Oh, snap. Welcome back, everybody. Another true crime video, another true crime reaction. Um, okay, so if you have not watched part one, I did a part one. I'll put the little thingy up. Where is it? Up here somewhere. Go watch part one first. Come back and watch this one if you're finding this video first. If you watched part one, uh, welcome back. So, man, this is an intense case. This is a very sad case. This is a disturbing case. Um, real quick, I'll do a quick recap. Back in February of 1983, these two teenagers broke into a old apartment building they went down in the basement one of them lit a cigarette and found a body okay turns out it was the body of a young they believe 8 to 11 year old girl and her head was missing yeah terrible she was wearing a yellow sweater and her hands were bound behind her back with a red and white jump rope so it was terrible just a terrible tragedy horrible murder um on part one we went through this half of this documentary um and we learned about uh how they were trying to start to come up with you know obviously trying to catch who did it but then trying to figure out who she is because there hasn't been a positive identity and so they were talking about all the schools in the neighborhood they were talking about all of that stuff okay so that gets us caught up and again, guys, that was very quick kind of synopsis recap. But go back and rewatch part one because it was, man, it was intense. Um, very, 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 very tragic story. Um, so let's dive into part two. So let's finish. I'm going to put my headphones on. I forgot to do that. Okay, now I feel like I'm in true crime mode. By the way, make sure you guys hit the like button. Welcome to all the new people. I, so I started doing a bit more of the true crime. Um, I did a couple of reels now, shorts, all that kind of stuff. And they've been getting a lot of attention. So it looks like you guys are liking the true crime stuff. So I'm going to keep doing that on here for a little bit. And I might end up transferring over to the Mystery Project. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. But... I do know that, hang on a second, I got to put up the fair use warning. So, well, not warning, but yeah. So, I'm going to react to this documentary for the purposes of criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, education, and research. And by the way, the links are in the description, guys. The links are in the description in this part. The links were in part one. Make sure you go and check out the Reddit uh, thread that I found this story in. The Wikipedia link is in there and the link to this documentary as well. All of it is in there. So let's jump into it. Okay, so they were talking about all the schools in the area. So now let's figure out, um, yeah, let's see what happened. Okay, and give me a thumbs up in the chat, guys, if you can hear this. You should be able to hear wow, some music. that is, that's unbelievable. Thumbs I, up in the, the chat, can you hear it? That that was going on with the uh, St. Louis Public Schools. It, were, it just seems, though, it's one of those things, that the facts, as they get revealed, just add to the confusion of the whole case. Which we located all the children of St. Louis. We started in the, the adjoining, like University City, Normandy, different school districts close to St. Louis, and see if they had any children missing or things like that. Trying to trying to find those kids. We, you know, we first we started in Missouri, then we we started when we were over in Illinois, contacting people over there. Uh, so that 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 was it. That, we were doing that for quite a while. Believe me. We even went through school's absentee records, and we haven't found anything. We were getting some phone calls about 
could be this child. So, so basically, guys. So what? So what happened is now they're trying to identify who this girl could be. They're going through the school records. They're going through absentee records, like they just said. And the public school system back then was not computerized like it is today, or not as well computerized. Remember, they showed the computer in part one. It was looked like I don't even know what it looked like a a microwave. Um, so they're having a, a hard time trying to go through all of this stuff and figure out. And like you just said, they can't. They it's showing up. Nothing is even coming up. It's terrible. Oh, it could be that. Child. How frustrating would that be, huh? Imagine, I mean, okay, so obviously, and we were talking last time, there was a bunch of comments in the in the comment section that it could be, the theory was that it could be parents, it could be family involved, and that's why she was never reported missing, there was never any absentee records, all that kind of stuff. Um, imagine how frustrating it would be for law enforcement, for these homicide detectives, if that was the case. And, like, you're going to go through all of this stuff that a normal missing person, missing child would have. And nothing's turning up. How frustrating that must be. And make sure you guys hit the like button on the way in. Let's get, let's dive into this. We got an hour to go. And uh, investigate it and see if the child was there. If she was there, we eliminated her. You know, it, it wasn't her. You know, that's that's basically what we were doing. Mm. We had the list of all the missing children, you know, nationwide, really. Wow. And, um, we didn't they get anything there either. You know, the rest of the school records, DFS, well, back then it was uh, aid and dependent children records. I found all these, remember those old computers that had the rails on the end? It was just they had every child that, that was receiving aid, every school child, every school child that was transferred from the city to the county schools to make sure they were accounted for. Uh, all that has recently been redone. In fact, we found several children that then that are now policemen that were on those roles that were checked on because they were either through busing or however they ended up in Kirkwood High School, Melville High School, but they lived in the city just to make sure that they were okay. So they did one hell of a job across the board. And then they sent a letter to every school district in the country. Jeez. My name is Tyrone Dennis. I am uh, originally from St. Louis, Missouri. I am a retired Atlanta police gang detective. When the informant had reached out with information basically indicating that he had information about the case, um, law enforcement initially uh, blew him off as it wasn't relevant. He, he kept. It wasn't relevant? Hold on. So in one breath, they, they, the guy just said that they went through this extensive search to find all of this, this build this list of missing persons. And then somebody says, I actually have information on the case. And they say that it's not, not uh, uh, important. He reached out to several different jurisdictions. And a little weird. Uh, finally got with someone uh, part of core. And they felt that law enforcement wasn't doing enough to, uh, interview this person or get the information that he was providing. Um, so they set up a sting with undercover detectives to interview him uh, about the information that he had. The informant uh, got upset and called the undercovers out as cops because they wouldn't give him the money that he requested, which was the $900. And the interview fell apart. Uh, oh, core, gosh. Uh, went up the chain and was able to be a commissioner. And he actually interviewed the informant himself at the Chase uh, Plaza Hotel in, uh, near Forest Park. Uh, he interviewed the informant for seven hours. The informant provided... Seven hours? See, there you go. And everybody coming in, thanks... Thanks for popping in. Thanks for coming to hang out during the live stream. Yes, this is part two. Thanks for being here, guys. Hit the like button. If you didn't watch part one, go back and watch part one first. Maybe not right now. But if you're watching this on the replay, go back and watch part one. No, it's not apple juice. It's uh, 
caffeine, caffeinated sparkling water. I didn't even know that was a thing. Zero calories. <laughs> okay, let's jump back in. Seven hour though, seven hour <coughs> interview. That's intense. Uh, a bunch of information, but it was later discovered that the informant was lying. Uh, the oh, informant geez. later recanted his statement and told Core that uh, even though they paid him six hundred dollars, that he was lying about it all. Uh, in his statement, he gave a detailed uh, location of where the victim's uh, head could be located in Waterloo, Illinois. Uh, law enforcement went to Waterloo, which is right across the river in, uh, on the east side of uh, in Illinois. Uh, once he got there, they searched and searched, and he indicated that they could find her head hanging from a tree, which they never located. Uh, oh, my God. Like, why would you... Especially a case like this, why would you make something like that up? I know he said they paid him, that he wanted $900, and they paid him $600. But even still, man, for $600, how could you do that? Like, how on earth could you do that? Ridiculous. Hallie, don't worry. We just started. Shout out to Mike. Thank you so much for the Super Chat. By the way, guys, same thing as part one. Um, all of the Super Chats that come in, all the donation Super Chats, all that stuff uh is going to go to um either I, I looked i didn't find anything for this one um but i'm gonna find some kind of charity a missing person missing persons charity something like that or and or i'm just going to go when i'm up around um this area up around st louis I'll, i'm gonna go to where she is laid to rest now and we're gonna get her flowers toys um you know a bunch of things that we can set um out there where she's laid to rest and and just let her know that that um, you know we're uh, we're she's not forgotten, and that that we we're thinking about her. She went through a lot more than anybody should ever go through, um, and so we're gonna we're gonna uh, show a little bit of love uh, the next time I'm up there. So Mike, thank you for that. The two dollars is gonna go to that, and any of the other super chats uh, that come through, all of them going are going to that. So I appreciate it, you guys. All right, let's jump back in. Seven seven hours, and then he lied about everything. That's that is ridiculous. Uh, and they later discovered, in looking at his uh, rap sheet, uh, that he had. Let me guess, con artist, something like that, fraud. Been charged for lying, uh, theft by deceit before, so which made him an incredible witness. All, all in all. I did get a call. Shocking. By the way, Mike, another $2. Thanks, man. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. When all this was going on, we were doing the school searches and everything. A lady, a gentleman called me. He was an aide to a senator from Florida, Paula Hawkins. And uh, he called up because they had a case in Florida with uh, Adam Walsh. Adam Walsh was a little boy that was abducted down there, and they found his head, but they didn't find his body. So he, we were talking. Jeez. They found the head and not the body? So the opposite of this girl. That's terrible. Man, what is going on, huh, in this world? That's so sad. Maybe we need to look... Maybe I need to look up uh, Adam Walsh. We look into this case next. We're talking, so we explained him what we were all doing, step by step. He says you're doing every, you're doing everything the right way, you know. But uh, we still didn't get him. <laughs> oh gosh, I was ready for it too. I was ready for it, guys. Sorry, I'm watching the documentary. I'm watching is not on. Um, it's not on YouTube, so I don't have the premium. It's on some random website I've never heard of. So I have to stop it for a second, give you guys shout outs um, for a minute before the L. Of course, it's the first one, too, so it's going to be a long one. But anyways, y'all, thank you so much. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for being here. 
Uh, make sure you hit the like button. Um, and yeah, oh my goodness, this is this case is so sad. It's like you got people coming in, you know, lying about what happened to try to to get money and stuff. It's like it's it's oh my god. I wonder if they charged him for that. What do you think? Would you? I think you you would have to have some kind of criminal charge or case for doing something like that, right? Should somebody look into that? <laughs> Let's do some digging and see if if they actually charge that guy because that would be that would be ridiculous. Which is well, hey, I guess some some of the police were like that's what they said. They called him out on that. They were like, oh, they didn't think it was credible. They didn't think it was credible, and maybe they knew. They were like, no, it's this guy. But even still, I mean, you got to sit down and you got to sit down and do. Uh, I guess you got to follow every lead, even if it's something like that, huh? Dang. Oh, man, Montreal decided to jump up here. No, don't worry, Keisha. You didn't miss much. We're just just popping in. Um, again, I'm watching the documentary on a uh, site that I don't have YouTube Premium on, and so it's running a whole bunch of ads. So I'm going to watch the ads. I'll spare you guys watching the ads. And by the way, if you're watching this on the replay, just fast forward about a minute because it's just about, well, I guess it wouldn't. Don't do it now because it's already over. But it's coming back on. It's trying to get me to get Candy Crush right now or something. Okay, we're back, guys. Okay, we're going back in. During the first months of the investigation, were there any viable leads that came in? That is a good question. We had a couple of leads that thought it might might be. And now I don't have sound. Oh, wait. I know why, because I muted the sound on the... Let me make sure that this volume is up, too. Okay. You know, that might have been the person... Uh, they found one house they were going to rehab it, and they found a bloody mattress in there. You know, we Jeez. responded. We found out <clears throat> where people moved. You know, and, and we would, we went there, and, and uh, the child was there. Everybody that we knew, everybody was accounted for. You know, we, we nobody knew at first. We always thought it was somebody out of one of the buildings. The kids that played in these apartments. The part that we played on that I described to you, that was a happy place. So when I came from my block, two blocks over, I played with the kid. I played with every kid that lived in that apartment building. And, and that, that made an awareness out of, out of parents. And you'd be surprised all the parents waiting at the bus stops for their kids. I would imagine so. We had some two ladies came in and they... <clears throat> And she started screaming, and this guy lived about two to two or three blocks away from her. He had a skull on his, on his mantelpiece. So we got it. We had a search warrant. We went in, went up there, and nobody was home. We got in, and uh, sure enough, there was a skull in there. And the said he had a machete. Well, a machete, you could take it and bend it like that. <laughs> you know, just some, geez. And there was some rope there, but turned out the young man, he was from California, and a high school teacher gave him that skull. And we were able to verify that. What? <laughs> what kind of high school teacher is like, oh, here. Take this skull. Oh, my goodness. Guys, would you accept a skull if a, te if a teacher gave it to you? If anybody gave it to you? Better question, who, if there is a person that you would accept a skull from, who would it be? Because I don't, I don't know if there's anybody I'd be like, oh, sure, let me take that skull off your hands. Uh, Captain Atkins, because uh, the way it's set up on missing persons and everything, back then it's still, still the same way. They have a clearinghouse. Each state has a clearinghouse. And the clearinghouse is the state police. So he had the secretaries, they wrote, they wrote to each state. 50 states and send them letters. That we, we tell them what they're investigating and we're trying to locate a child, describe the victim. We didn't get any responses. 
the FBI started at the NCIC National Crime Information Center when missing persons they go in that they have a missing person file. So they were certain we got we got all those searches. We get enough age permits what we were looking for eight eight to eleven eight. The child decapitated, different things tied tied up in rope, things like that.、Mm. We didn't get a hit. Somebody out there knows something. Talk to your neighbor. Talk to your friends. Somewhere out there is a mother without a little girl. A brother without a sister, a neighbor without a little girl walking down the street. Do the camera sing and knock it on. I mean, if you think about it too, y'all, that's the that's the scariest part and really the saddest part is that he's right. Like that little girl didn't just appear out of thin air. Like she has parents. She might. She probably has siblings. She definitely somebody has seen that little girl walking. Somewhere before. Wow. When you think about it like that, it hits a little bit different, doesn't it? Been on doors that people are going to talk to you. Some won't. Some say I was at home. You know, and then then you got to start back and getting into the nitty gritty. You know that. And a lot of these kids, and we we couldn't find them. We'd go door to door, go go to the house, and that going. So we were calling these police departments and trying to find out the admit you just missing children. Blah blah blah. And they do their investigation, and they call us back. And a lot of them return home, and the parents never call the police and say she's back. You know, so that was that's where we found a lot, a lot of children. You know, but we and they're surprised、uh, uh, how people used to thank us for what we were doing. You know, we, we were trying everything we could do. You know, juvenile officers and the, and the homicide detectives, and you know, trying to trying to find out who this little girl was. Mm. We could reunite her with her family. Wow. People started calling her Jane Doe.、Uh, one time we got a call for on a Sunday, and supposedly somebody was in that basement. That's before they tore the building down. And in the front part,、uh, they found us、uh, like a gym bag. You know, the old gym bags, and there was they could see an imprint in the dust, and and they thought they thought it was. They made a big thing out of that. You know. And、uh, you know, the bosses and they said we searched that area. Well, it was thoroughly searched, you know. And、uh, so you, you know, somebody put it in there, and they made they made the wrong connection. They thought it might have been, you know. But, wow. We, you know, when any crime scene, when you're done, you try and cam it. Totally unrelated incident. There was a police report on that. And. For them not to have searched the building itself would be crazy to me because they did like extensive, probably three, four block canvas search. Treated like a spectacle once a state legislator and a group of psychics arrived demanding. To see the body, wow! And here, watch. This is where I remember, and we read the Wikipedia article in part one, and they talked about how the sweater and the and the jump rope went missing in the mail. Do y'all remember that? Nine months. Nine months. Oh my gosh! Nine months. I mean, I, I can understand waiting to see if the family would come to 
to claim her if somebody would come through, but nine months. Holly Berry, yeah, I couldn't wait. Part two is supposed to be on Tuesday, but I couldn't wait. But I'm going to do another one on Tuesday and another one on Thursday, I'm sure. I'm having a lot of fun. It's sad. It's terrible. It's terrible, these these stories and these crimes, but it's good to watch. It's good to spread the word and get it out there. Very, 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 very cool. Mm. That's the church. I still, to this day, I've never forgotten that assignment for 39 years ago. Hi, my name is Ed today. Well, I started at the St. Louis Gold Democrats as photojournalist about um, six months after the little girl body was found. And I remember that day up in the photo lab, the photo director came to me and said, Ed, I got a photo job here for you. You need to head out to Washington Cemetery near the airport to photograph a little girl's funeral. And I was driving out there, I'm thinking to myself, what? I don't know what to expect to cover a funeral. I lost my dad, and I knew what a, to me, visualize what a ceremony was at a burial site. So I. Wow. Wow. Look at those pictures. Mm. They said the cemetery workers were the pallbearers bringing her down. Just thinking, like, there's going to be lots of people, wow. you know, family members. And I remember I got to the cemetery, and I remember getting out of the car, and it was a um, cold, cloudy, dreary day. And I noticed that the ground was kind of muddy. And as I got out of the car, I made my way up to the burial site. And about that time, the uh, pallbearers were getting a little white casket, getting ready to carry up to near the location I was standing. Uh, there was a spot there for the media. There might have been some other TV people there at the time taking some um, movie. But I just remember being up there next to the casket on the, on the ground. I started to take my pictures of the pallbearers bringing the casket up towards me. And as they got up towards me, and at the time there were just four individuals there around that the casket. It was a police detective, some medical examiner, and a minister, somebody else. And I do remember that at the time that the ceremony started, it was it was a very quick ceremony. But as the ceremony began, I started taking my pictures. What really struck me as I was looking through the camera it was the four empty chairs next to the white casket. And I thought to myself, how sad that is that a funeral here for this little girl and there's nobody there. And to me, I was thinking, those four chairs should be filled with a parent or parents, a sibling or a family member. And they weren't. They were empty. Y'all. Yeah. Yeah, that that is heartbreaking. Mm. And that really struck me when I was taking my pictures. Wow. This little girl had a father or a parent, and there was nobody there. The camera, to me, has always been a buffer, like a shield between you and the news event. You feel kind of shielded behind with your emotions, what's happening. And I felt that way at that time, photographing that ceremony, is driving back from the funeral service, burial service, back to the newspaper to process my pictures. I was running through my mind the pictures that I shot at that time and it always kept coming back to me is when I get to that print of the four individuals and the white cast and forms of chairs, I thought that was my strongest picture to present to the city desk. Yeah, I'd say so. I'd say so. Absolutely. Wow. Oh, man, that is heartbreaking. That is heartbreaking. Rin, I, and I'm seeing the comments, guys. Rin, yeah, so... That it, she still hasn't been identified. So the parents or 
whoever was responsible for her didn't never reported her missing, never, never came forward. So it's terrible. The entire ceremony lasted five minutes. Goodness gracious. Y'all, man, I'm telling you, the entire ceremony lasted five minutes. Like, I get it, but, you know, I mean, they're, they're like, like the reverend and people are there. They're just kind of like, okay, let's pay our respects. But five minutes. I'm telling you, when I'm up there, guys, the next time I'm anywhere close to St. Louis, we're gonna we're gonna make a we're gonna make a, a stop over there and um, add some more flowers and and um, and things like that to maybe even do. Um, I'll I'll spend a little bit more than five minutes there too. I'll say some prayers and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. And that's what I was saying, Mike. Thanks for the the two super chats, guys. The super chats are gonna go to that. Help me, help me do that. So I appreciate it, you guys. Okay, let's keep going. Wow. Oh, that was sad. Why would it be inappropriate? Why the heck would it be inappropriate? I hope that changed. Inappropriate. Yeah, it's exactly what I would have done. Good. Even that, look, from February 2nd. It, well, I guess, okay, from February 2nd, then it got erected in May. surprised all the uh, psychics who called you know and they're, and they're, they're really sincere you know and, and uh, I went out to one house and they're all sitting there, there's a whole table full of them you know and they're going this and that and sat there and I took notes you know you know keep an open mind you know the, you know, the one one fellow one person decided that she was on a fishing boat in the Gulf of Mexico her head you know who are you going to call about that? <laughs> I can see why maybe, you know, when you've, you've chased down every lead, when you found every supposed missing child in the St. Louis public school system and you still haven't turned up anything, you would maybe decide, you know, what, let's try it. Let's see what happens, you know. Mm. Later on, uh, so this was an ongoing investigation, you know, all these years we're working on it. I mean, uh, again, if you knew the volume of anonymous letters. Every year for several years, we would. Yeah, think about that, guys. Back then, there's no email. You know what I mean? There's no website they can submit a tip through like nowadays, right? Or like, you know, forums and Reddit and things like that. There's no... Nothing like that. They have to mail in handwritten letters and they, somebody has to go through, open that up, read it, file it. You can't search. You can't put them all in one big file and search for keywords or anything like that. No. One by one. Can you imagine? Mm, goodness gracious. 
would put on the Hope Points bulletin about this case on our anniversary, trying to see that any any whether any department have any missing children fit in this description, you know, contact us. But in 1985, the FBI began a program called VICAP, Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, and then they're looking at unusual type homicides, serial rapists, serial killers, things like that. So that case was the first one we was entered in Missouri, you know. And、uh, oh wow, the first one entered in the entire state.、Mm. I've never, I've never got anything. I, And when they started names,、uh, she's、uh, also entered in there. We never had one like that before in the FBI. When I told you when they came in at that time, they never had one like this before. Even one is too many, y'all. It was nice to watch how they did it, you know, and everything else, and.、Uh, Uh, and I, they wouldn't. The news media wouldn't let them have any pictures or stuff like that, you know, film clips or anything. So I said, "Hey, he says, 'Can we have some pictures of the park?'" Yes, he says, "Yes, you can." You know, so he sends them up there and says, "Whatever you do, don't show those pictures on TV." <laughs> you know? And I was sitting with, I was sitting with、uh, two ladies, and every time we're talking, they, they bring a picture. I'm watching as a man. <laughs> If that puts on TV, I'm, I'm going to New York. I'm not going back to St. Louis. <laughs> But they, you know, they, they kept their word. You know, and it was、uh, we, you know, there was like three or four cases they featured on that. You know, and, they, and、uh, the other ones they caught them. You know, the other ones they caught. That's good to hear, but. Man, I still—it's so sad to think how gruesome this was, and how that person. Who knows? Maybe they're in jail. Maybe they, maybe they—they've died now. By now, maybe they. Who knows? Hmm. Was another another officer, and they had some storage shut. And he seen a guy there, you know, and they stopped talking to him. And he looked in there, and he saw a skull. So he took the skull, you know, seized it, and they took it over to uh, uh, medical examiner's office, and they sent it up to、uh, the armed force of the thousand. Looked at it, and they said, "No, it was a male." Sightings. I remember that show. I remember sightings. You remember that show? Ren H. Yeah, the、uh, the rope that was used. Yeah, it was a jump rope. It was a red and white、uh, nylon jump rope. Those old、uh, jump ropes. I remember those too. But I remember this show. Sightings. That was that was Captain Atkins. He was Chief Atkins then. But he just wanted, you know, he just wanted to、uh, maybe generate some. Some publicity for that show, you know, that it, it might help us, you know. That's that's what it was. And see, guys, that's exactly why I love doing these kind of videos is to get the cases out, you know. Because even though I mean the haunted side, yes, I do paranormal investigations.、Um, it's still investigating, and that investigative mindset that I have. Um, kind of bleeds over into true crime, which is something I've always been passionate about. That's why I remember sightings. I remember watching unsolved mysteries, all that kind of stuff. And so that's why I, I given the the platform that I have with this channel, that's why I wanted to start doing stuff like this. I want to start doing these live streams, reactions,、um, kind of bringing it to、uh, to any audience that I have as well. Because who knows? I mean, did, who said that they live ten minutes away from? Who just said that? Was that、uh, Holly Berry? Yeah, twenty minutes away. You live twenty minutes away from there. What if you knew something and you saw this? And you're like, oh man, wait a second. When was this? 
That's why I love doing this. Let's keep going. The lady, uh, she needed stuff. We sent it to her. It didn't come back, you know. And I, I called her last year. Yeah. Man, so I say I remember the show, and then it's the show's lady that loses the the sweater and the jump rope. Come on. Ask her. Oh, Maybe it's yeah, not her I fault. It Maybe it really is. Let's find out. And she said, "Oh, I sent it back, but never came there. Never got it, you know." And that that came up, you know. It's embarrassing, you know. But you, you're doing it in good faith. Wonder, like, you know, if she was really such a great psychic, could they have sent a piece of the sweater instead of the whole thing? I, you know, I don't know. Or a picture? <laughs> she, he, oh, so they reached out to Doreen. She declined an interview and assured me that she sent the Roman sweater back. Tony, bring up the poor old Doreen. Spoke it to him. So uh, <laughs> I got the receipt. She mailed it back or mailed something back to police headquarters. Yeah. Well, I'm telling you there's evidence. I'm telling you there's a guy that signed for it that's still on the police department. I'm not willing to put him out there. So apparently, oh, I caught that one by accident. I, that ad came up quick, guys, and I was about to stop it anyways. Wow. So maybe she did send it back. What do you think in the chat? Did she send it back? He's the, the he's saying that, that they have a signed evidentiary, you know, postal return, like, slip. What do you all think? And, guys, if you're new here, if you're just finding the channel, I see a whole bunch of new people in the chat. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you would. Hit the like button, you guys. This is part two. If you didn't uh, catch part one, then after this stream, go back and watch part one. You can watch them all. And then um, we'll do another stream on Tuesday night. Tuesdays, Thursdays, and probably one, two days on the weekend. So. Sorry, says you know what the Postal Service is like, Patrick. That's true. Molly and Emily in the house. Hey there, guys. Thank you much. Thanks for popping in, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm, I know I'm not reading the chats as much, but I really want to focus in on here. Um, but thank you guys for the super chats. Again, all the super chats going to um, the a charity that either for this case specifically or one very similar to it, the missing person case. Um, and I'm going to go and put some flowers and things um, on her uh, gravesite as well. Uh, when I'm in, in or around St. Louis, I'm going to make that happen, guys. So thank you for sending in those super chats. That's exactly where that is going to go. Okay, let's jump right back in. The ad is finished. Sweater and rope. Mm. Imagine if this guy found it. Like, imagine if he's like, I just wanted to try and see... What I, what could happen, and I ended up finding it. Wait, like he actually found, he found like the same sweater. What? How did he do that? <laughs> Sass, thanks for posting the link tree link. Yeah, guys, anything that comes through on the link tree, uh, link tree, all that stuff, go into this. Very interesting comparison. Looks right on. I 
got the same analysis from somebody in the military. No, no. I think you go in, you delve in a whole another. Yeah, I would say yes. I, I think there's blood sufficiently, sufficiently. Again, on a sweater, you can't tell for sure, but I just got a feeling that, you know, the way the blood is patterned and pooled and etc. on the sweater, I think it was on. That is absolutely terrifying. I see he's had the cigar the whole time, but I thought right there he had it lit. I was like, okay. But no, it's not lit. Cool shit there. That's great work. We had the uh, behavioral science, and the guy that was in charge of the VICAP program, he's a, uh, he was retired in Oakland, California. At our so Souza, hold on. From the director of this documentary. You directed this documentary? Thank you so much. Hey, the whole time I have been talking about how well of a job you did with the uh, details. Like every single detail. It wasn't just you skim through it. You went into a massive amount of detail. I think what what was it on the first um, part one? We talked about how it was. Um, you talked about how it was like 0.5 millimeters to two millimeters of growth on the mold. I was like, how? That's like next level. Uh, ne that's next level. Huge shout out! Thank you so much. And again, guys, by the way, make sure you go. And show the documentary love. I have the link in, down in the description. Uh, and if there's any other links, let us know. Put up anything you want, and we and uh, we'll all go over there and check it out. Um, and again, thank you for the five dollar super chat. Again, I don't know if you heard, but that any super chats that come in during these live streams are going to go to um, if there is some kind of foundation or some kind of something set up for her or for a case like this. Um, at the very least, the next time I'm in St. Louis area, I'm going to go and buy flowers. Uh, Michael even said silk flowers, which I think is a great idea because those will last a very, very long time. Um, so let us know if there's anything like that. So thank you so much for popping in. Thank you for that. That's pretty amazing. And Mike, oh, look at everybody saying, wow, wow, great. I know. I'm telling you, man, I was very impressed with how thorough you were and you're saying it's very important because yeah there was a lot was wrong with the story wow fantastic oh wait for the end and you will see what can help thank you so much for that very cool look massive high five incredible how did you know to be here <laughs> everybody wants to know wow mike oh another two dollars super chat thank you for that very cool. Okay, well, now I'm excited because you said wait till the end and we'll figure out how we can help. So fantastic. Again, thank you so much for popping in and thank you for the $5 super chat. Very, very cool. Wreaking havoc in the house as well. Wreaking, how, how's it going? All right, Terry let's keep going. Green. And Terry, we're talking about, about the headless girl, you know, and he says, you know, we never ate. He said, they have never had another case like that in the United States that was reported. My son told me, and he was pretty sick. He was passing away and he was talking about, it. he was kind of out of it, but he said, I'm going to find out who, get, who she is. I'm going to find out who killed her. He was, it's still on his mind. You know, he's dying. Guys, if you have questions, go ahead. Actually, I do have a question. Do you have more? Do you have more of these documentaries? Do you have more cases that you've done? Do you have anything else that uh, that we could uh, take a look at? Because, again, like I said, I went through a bunch. I went through different things. And this documentary specifically, I was so blown away with the, the attention to detail. And I was like, yeah, no. this is And this is the first of my true crime series. 
and this is the one this was the video i picked and i was like oh yeah no this this is how i want to start this series so yeah do you have more and where can i find them Music. and are you doing more and would you like some help <laughs> he was a good man We believe that if she wouldn't have been found when she was found, or if they ever did find her, you know, then when they tore a building down, they might discover a body in there. But it would, uh, it, it could have been, for, you don't know how many years later, and you're really in trouble. Yeah, uh, that's, they tore it down. I mean, I know we've already d discovered that, but. They tore it down. Mm. Somebody actually, is it still vacant? I maybe maybe you would know, but is it still vacant? Because somebody said that there was a, a nursing home that was built on top of that land. Now we were curious to find that out. I was out there, I guess three or four times <clears throat> with different people come in and want to see it. You know. It's hard to find. Oof. Well, it started that uh, Ron Henderson. He mentioned about a new pro new program the FBI had, where you you can uh, you get the bone, you can take the bone, and and uh, they can find water in the bone. And they can tell what the air part of the United States she was from. Okay. That's when 9 11 hit. Well, that was the end of that. Oh, God. Dan Fox did a, did a lot of work on that in between. And Tom Carroll did, you know, for a while. And, he, uh, and then uh, Dan took it up there and then he got a lot of this stuff going. And Dan was able to. Uh, make some calls and this and that, but he, he got a little of the Smithsonian Institute and he explained it all to him and they just said, yeah, we'll do that. No cost or anything. Wow. And it is, so it is a, uh, it is a, a nursing home. Oh my well, a lot of it was, was, God. was disrepair. The records weren't the best in the world out there. The lady, uh, the lady that owned it committed suicide. What? Bones were found above ground amongst trash and debris. Oh my God. Where is this place? Well, I guess it's in St. Louis, right? But I, what the heck is going How can you do that? How can that even happen? Oh, wow. Look, they discovered a body the day on the day the last ever MASH aired and the news covered that for the first nine minutes of the night. And the discovery wasn't until after the first commercial break. Dear God. That is terrible. Oh. But then uh, we went the cemetery where she was born buried you know then we, we had a problem trying to locate the grave at the grave rightfully so it seems like yeah, that was a, 
What? Three bodies crowded together. None of them were her. And the headstone was placed on the wrong grave. And how long did it take? And and it took the school writing letters and all that stuff for them to even get the headstone there. And when they got it, they put it on the wrong place? My word. Some that students. is heartbreaking, Sass. It's heartbreaking. A stone for her. You know, and uh, but she wasn't exactly buried right there. We had to, we had a, uh, they had a, we they dug up several of them, several of them, but it wasn't a child's coffin or anything, you know. So we had, we put the body, we stopped it there. How, what, like, what would you do? How would you move to, how would you determine where to go? Where to go next? Like, how do you determine that? Hold on. Okay. I read it wrong for a second, and I was like, wait a second. Okay, no, that's okay. Mm. My name is Abby Stiliano. I'm an assistant professor of computer science at St. Louis University. I was a research scientist at Washington University back in 20, I started in 2012. Um, and I was working on an intelligence agency project. So it was IARPA. Um, and my uncle knew about this. And he read an article in the Post-Dispatch about the Jane Doe from 1983, Hope. It was about how they had tried to exhume her remains to do modern forensic analysis and they weren't able to correctly uh, find her remains in Washington Park Cemetery. Um, and so this article included a picture of the burial and he knew what I was working on at the time. And so he came to me and he was like, hey, you should help these people out. Um, and it was sort of an obvious thing to do. The, the tools we were developing were obviously applicable. The photograph that was included um, in the story was taken right at the corner of her grave site. So if you could figure out where the camera was that took that picture, you would pretty accurately be able to know where the grave site was. Uh, so I got in touch. I think the first person I reached out to was Calvin Whitaker. Um, so Calvin was helping to lead some of the cleanup efforts at Washington Park Cemetery and helping to sort of get people together to try and identify her, uh, the location of Hope's remains. Uh, and so I, uh, talked to Calvin and I said, you know, I'd be interested in coming out and seeing the location. What we would need to do to be able to figure out where the camera was is to say, to look at the picture that we had from 1983 and say, where are, you know, What I think, what I think about too, is that so remember the guy that was talking about how he took this picture and how the four chairs were signifying like the family members, or you know he felt like it was empty, like it should have been, like there should have been somebody there. Well, think about it this way, y'all. Here we are, nearly forty years later, and it's not four people using that picture, using that, but it's millions of people. It's millions of people now that are seeing that this view, people taking technology like this, putting things together to try to figure out where this she was actually buried at. Think about that, y'all. Like in the in the moment he was thinking, man, these four chairs should have been full. And here we are 40 years later. Could he have even fathom? Could he have even fathom that that this this would happen? Just think about that. 
just think about that. And I see that. Yeah, I see that you were saying that uh, from the last one. We were we were like, I was like blown away that there would be. They were like, how did this happen in transport? What the heck? It was that was strange to me. We're saying they reused the bag. So the the bag that came that she went in was reused. And so when they got back to the morgue, they found the hair. Even that. That's. I mean, wow. Thank you. See, look. You want to talk about detailed, thorough? I can tell. Oh, don't stress. You can, you can, I mean, you can say whatever you want. Thank you. Thanks again for being here. Seriously. Okay. But you know what I mean, though? But really, think about that, guys. That's, that is pretty wild, isn't it, Jessica? Yeah. And this is, uh, ooh. Or any. Well, she's in the documentary, so I imagine she helped and they, they ended up finding her. Right? Of those things still today. Wow. And so if we can figure out that, you know, the billboard that we see in the background of the picture is at this particular GPS location and this headstone that we see in the background is at this other location. Uh, if you can sort of, tr essentially you're doing a triangulation. If you can triangulate all of these things and figure out the correspondence between where they are in the real world and where they were in the picture, you can use that information to solve for the camera's location. Post dispatch reporter, uh, Christine Byers, she was able to get hold of some people. And a one fella called a gentleman, he was a, used to be a uh, photographer for the, the, the Globe Democrat, and he still had his pictures. And we got out there in 2013, and instead it's, you know, dense forest for a lot of it. You know, they had cleared the immediate area around her grave. Some of the headstones while they were doing the cleanup had been picked up and moved. The billboards that were in the background of the picture, it turned out they had been cut down and rebuilt, um, you know, wow. 10 feet away. And 10 feet matters when you're trying to figure out camera geometry. We were able to write this report for the medical examiner that said, you know, here's our estimate. Um, so we didn't pinpoint an exact, you know, it's exactly here. We said, here's a five foot region. Detective Fox asked us uh, to go out and mark the location. Um, so I was able to work with some folks in the facilities department at WashU. We were able to get access to their like really high precision GPS device. Randy L. Jackson. I'm one of the guys that dug a tombstone. They put it right there in the wrong place. Okay, but the body was here. The day we had, when we were digging it up, a storm was coming in. And we had very little time to do anything but dig. We were hoping that uh, once we opened the grave, it wouldn't fill up with water. And then they wanted me to be there for the exhumation. I'm pretty sure because they wanted somebody to blame if we were wrong. Uh, but oh, we wow. want camera geometry, it turns out, like if you don't have a lot of distortion in the images, which these didn't have a ton, um, the camera geometry is pretty straightforward. Um, and so we were able to, her, I think the center point that we marked, the folks who did the exhumation said it was within about eight inches of where her casket ended up being. But it- Wow. Like <laughs> that talk about- eight inches it wasn't that straightforward actually the day of when we were doing the exhumation um they dug down and at about three feet they hit a casket and so they dug up the casket um and it the, and it wasn't hers it was somebody built somebody buried on top of her oh my how does that happen what's sad too is that that's probably it, there's no way that's the only cemetery where something like that's happened right like, think about that. That's terrifying, too. They were adult remains. Uh, and so it was not her, at the location that we had marked. And so that was, you know, we were concerned. We believed our estimates, but obviously that wasn't correct. And I think I was, you know, in my mid-20s at the time, and I was cocky. And I said, no, I, you know, I believe we're, we're looking at. And in some of the dirt that we had pulled up, there was a handle that looked right. Um, the, it looked like the picture is what we could see on the side of her casket. And so I, we looked sort of in the adjacent locations and she wasn't there. And I said, let's go back. Like, let's dig down. This sort of the freight you hear six feet under, right? We hadn't gone six feet down. Um, mm. So we dug below where that first casket was. And it turned out that was where her remains were. So we. Got it. Wow.
I can't even, guys. I can't. It's so messed up. It's so messed up. And then to hear that the lady that ran, well, she didn't really run the cemetery, did she? The lady who, I guess, owned it is what you could say. Self-deleted. I wonder if that was years and years of guilt. I mean, I have no idea. That's speculation, right? But, I mean, for me, I feel like if I did, so, if I was responsible for something like that, I would be very shameful. By the way, shout out everybody in the chat. Thanks for being here. Make sure you go show the original documentary some love. The link is in the description. Uh, the director is in the chat. Oh, my goodness. And they tore down half of it to build the Metrolink light rail system. That's why the signs are moved. Wow. Illegally burning because they... Oh, my God. Y'all give it up. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Show some love, guys. Go show some love to the uh, to the original uh, video. And hit the like button, you guys. Hit the like button. Okay, let's keep going. Get, the, get it open. We had our tree, which we said here, the roots that grow over part of the casket itself. But we were able to open the casket mm. and take the, the uh, body bag and in the casket, pick the whole thing up, put it in another body bag, and haul it off. So when we assume the body to get a positive identifier of the body, I was able to look and see it was decapitation at the shoulder level, and it was her. It was right here where that baby was. Doesn't. They didn't move the. I guess that's probably a lot harder to do than, than it sounds. But they wouldn't move the stone. Because he's saying that's where they dug it up. They would. They weren't able to move that stone. She wanted to be cremated so people wouldn't look down on her. Wow. It. The cast is still there. She's not. And Charlie was at every step of the way involved. And I wouldn't have done it if he hadn't told me about it. That was her uncle? But they did. Well, Mike, that's what you say. What about the, the smell at three feet, right? But keep in mind that it also said that they were finding bones and fragments of stuff like that in the just trash and debris on the ground. And then think about animals and things like that. Like, oh my God. I did find her. You know, they took her to, uh, they, they took her down to the, the morgue and they did, they did some additional, you know, whatever they could do, but they did get sections of the bone. Hey, shout out. That's where I went to school, guys. That's where I graduated from. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> what a small world that is. Wow. 
So that's so she spent she it's possible that she spent most of her childhood in one of those states. And then it would have been about here. No, sorry. Yeah. So she was brought there. Wow. Oh, she uh, she spent most some of her American childhood, American most of her childhood in the, the, the South. She came from the southeastern part of the United States at one time. You know, that's where the water shook. She from Molly and Emily. So, from what we've heard so far, uh, they believe she was between eight and eleven years old. Step down there too again. Oh, perfect. That's what I was. That's what I was curious about. That's awesome. Uh-huh. That was a cold that she was buried at, at Calvary. Uh, my name is Peter Gunas. I'm a uh, Catholic deacon. Uh, I volunteered with the organization called uh, Garden of Innocence. Garden of Innocence. Wow. Since it's a Catholic ceremony, but we don't know if these children were baptized. We don't know if they're Catholic or not. So I do sort of a, I guess you'd call it an interfaith service. Rebecca picks out the names, but the name that they give that that child is Precious Hope because they name all the children at their services. And there's the name of the documentary. And they wanted to rebury her in a place where she wouldn't be lost. And so uh, I guess that's why they contacted Rebecca. And um, and so she called me to do the service. Wow. And see again, unbelievable attention to detail and how you were able to find this footage. Yeah, it was very hard to find. He says, I would imagine. Lucky it even existed. Yeah, Doctor Who. Not surprisingly, it was quite somber. Uh, even, I guess, to the, to the level of being sad. Mm. And we do a short graveside commendation service. Uh, 
But when we were out there with the bagpipes and everything, um, I was thinking, boy, uh, we got a lot going on and we picked a cold day to do this. Jesus said to the crowd, everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me because I came down from heaven not to reject anyone who comes to me, but to do the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should lose nothing of what he gave me, but that I should raise it on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him they have eternal life, and I shall raise him on the land. Yeah, that does look like a pretty cold day, huh? That's For kilts. Wow. There you go. That one lasted over an hour. Wow. I belong to the International Homicide Investigators Association. A couple of years ago, we went to uh, Las Vegas, and uh, Dan Fox was there. You know, so we were at Parabon, the two of us talking to him. Talking to the man, he says, "Yeah, they can do mm. it. They're going to they're going to try." Parabon has done some pretty and, uh, extensive work. They've helped you know, a lot of years, cases. Where do you start? You know, uh, they they had some genealogy they are working on. You know, and uh, where it's going, I don't know. I really do believe that the answer to identifying her is through investigative genetic genealogy. But yep. we need a little help. We need a little luck in this case. And so far, I have not gotten either of those. Once you get into that ge genealogy and you start dealing with one-on-one -on -one comparisons and stuff like that, I think a lot more can be done than could ever be done before. Is, but, it, is it in the genealogy? Oh, yes. Yeah. You're the first to know that. When you go down a road and you hire a company and individuals, and I think we've got one of the best in the world, if not the best. So you got to let that play out. You don't start interrupting your your work. And you know I've had it a few years, but. Because of her age, we're not even messing with reconstructing what she would look like. Because once, if you're under 14, that's, that's no good. It's not even, from what I'm told, and again, I'm not a scientist, but I'm told that it's not worth it. And that don't cost a whole lot to do, but it's not accurate. Wow. We have ruled out a whole lot of people. Tell you that, um, and most St. Louis people now. We're looking for family members, and just a little closer than what we got. Yeah. We got some, but they're not close enough enough to know who it would be, or reasonably know. Who Ooh. Well, I can tell you we're one submission away. Somebody happened to drop their stuff in there and left it open so it could be searched against what we got spinning around out there in that world. Uh, it could hit just like you see all these other hits all over the country. Wow. When somebody drops their stuff in there and it hits. Takes work, but it can be done like very rapidly. You might want to try and reach out to them. CC more. 
Parabon now. Oh, Parabon? Yeah. See, they talk to me. They, I, we've been discussing it, and I've given them permission to, so. I appreciate that. But nobody else knows yet, and if they need to re verify that with us. Wow. I'm Cece Moore. I'm the chief genetic genealogist at Parabon Nano Labs. I have been working on the St. Louis Jane Doe case for years now. So I'm surprised they let you allow me to talk about it because this is the first time in, in all these years I've been working on it that I've had permission to actually acknowledge that I've been working the investigative genetic genealogy on it. Wow, that's awesome. It is my oldest unsolved, unidentified remains case. And it's incredibly frustrating to me. This is a case that I was familiar with before I had the opportunity to work on it. I was so excited to have this chance to help identify her. And I've been able to help solve over 220 cases now all across the country and, and several other countries as well. And so the fact that I have not been able to identify her is heartbreaking to me. In this case, uh, it's an African-American case, of course, and there is a decent amount of representation in the genetic genealogy databases, but much less so in GEDmatch, which is our primary database. So there's a big misconception out there that we are able to use Ancestry DNA, 23andMe, MyHeritage DNA. And their terms of service don't allow law enforcement to use those databases. Oh, I didn't know that. Is that that really? I thought for sure. I thought for sure they that they would be able to get they would be able to use that for so, like somehow. Or like just like in the terms of service, let you let you decide. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I have a button where it's like, okay, you click here if it is okay to use this in criminal investigations. Click here if it's not. And if the people click that it's not, then you serve them warrants. And then everybody else, you... <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if they, they're like, oh, no. Then it just, like, emails the detective. And it's like, this person said no. even for unidentified remains cases like this one. And so there's about 40 million people that have tested at consumer DNA testing companies. It's a, a recent survey showed that about two out of 10 Americans say they've taken a consumer DNA test. If I had access to all of those tests for comparison, I'm sure I could identify her. But wow. I only am allowed to use the two smallest databases, which are GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA. I'm using only public records, by the way. That's another misconception. I don't have any sort of special access. I don't have law enforcement access. I on the map on the uh, in the DNA databases, I can only see what others can see. I don't get any special information. We process this DNA in such a way that we can find distant cousins. So traditionally in law enforcement, they are using STRs, which will work for an exact match or a first degree relative match. So you could find parent, child, full siblings with that. But with investigative genetic genealogy, we are analyzing hundreds of thousands of SNPs, different type of genetic marker, and they are spread all across the genome. And this allows us to detect distant cousins, third, fourth, fifth, sixth cousins, and even beyond. Oh my God. Six cousins or beyond? That's why she's saying, imagine if she had the DNA from two out of every 10 then you would find every six, seven to eight beyond you'd find immediately. She'd be like, yep, here we go. Here's the family. So we are reverse engineering the identity of these unknown individuals based on who they're sharing DNA with in these two genetic genealogy databases. In this case, 
we actually had two really promising matches at the top of the list. I thought this case was going to be solved in a week. Ooh. I was so excited when I saw them. But then when I dug a little deeper, I learned that my two top matches were born, each of them, about 100 years ago. One of them was 99 years old when I started working this case, and one of them was 100 years old. So when you're working with African-American genealogy, you often run into that genealogical brick wall of slavery. So I'm not saying it's impossible to find records before 1870, but it is much more challenging to wow. build African-American family trees back before 1870, but when they were named in the federal census for the first time. My oh, wow. uh, second match, his father was born in 1865 and her grandfather was born in 1800. Well, I have to build these trees back to a level where I can find a common ancestor. And so if someone is a second cousin of this little girl, for instance, you would expect them to share great grandparents. But if I can't build back to someone's great grandparents in slavery, because we don't have the records, they didn't keep the then records. there's no way for me to build forward and find the descendants of that individual or those individuals. So when I reached out to the family of this match, because by the time I got the match, she was deceased. So I reached out to the kit manager, who's her granddaughter. And when I told her that I was working on an unidentified remains case with law enforcement, she shut me down, said, don't ever contact me again. And she pulled the DNA from the GEDmatch database. Again, I can understand, but this set me back a lot. Why? Why? What do you mean she, you can understand? Well, how can you understand that? That doesn't make any sense to me. Guys, what do you think about that? That doesn't make any sense to me. You have somebody calling you saying, hey, there is somebody that is an unidentified little girl that is potentially in your family, or in your family, right? Because they said that she matched it back to this person. It's in your family. This is your fifth cousin, sixth cousin, you know, that is unidentified, that went through this horrible experience as a child, can, like, can we have a talk? Can we discuss things? I, I would, I would love to find out who, how far back you can trace your, your lineage. And they shut, they say, no, no, I don't care about that person. I don't care about that little girl. And then go so far as to then remove the DNA from the site where she was even able to get it from? Well, Ren, I understand not wanting to be involved. They could not be involved. But I think that, I mean, there's like a fine line of like, okay, like, okay, I, uh, I, I don't want to be involved in this. But let me try to help figure out if this person, is, you know, who this person is. I mean, they don't have to be on, like, the news and stuff. I don't know. Oh, they couldn't tell her what the case she was working on? They couldn't tell them what case she was working on. Oh, so she can only say, I'm looking into a case. So this person was like, Maybe they're looking at me or my brother or like maybe they knew something like a dark secret in the family and they were like, no, 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 no. Not knowing that it was to do. Oh, OK, so well, that makes sense. The top match was also pretty promising, but she was also around 100 years old. So her family very quickly went back to the time of slavery. And both of these women were descended from enslaved individuals. And so I am dealing with that problem. Um, and the daughter of that match said she would help, but then just ghosted me. Now, because of their ages compared to what the age of our Jane Doe was, we're probably looking at uh, removals in generations, meaning we're looking at a generational difference here. It's not likely that they're second cousins. They may be first cousins twice removed or half first cousins once removed, something like that. And so I might not have to go quite as far back in the tree but the other thing I think I'm dealing with here 
are some misattributed parentage situations or maybe adoption situations oh, wow. where somebody's family tree on paper doesn't accurately represent their genetic descent. And so if, you know, I can build trees all day with paper, but it doesn't necessarily prove that those are somebody's ancestors. Yeah. And that's where it would really help to have assistance from the matches families. Like if they put somebody else on the birth certificate as the father, than the person who actually is the father. Because I need to determine if what this matches family tree really is what it is on paper. I've tried working with some of the more distant matches for that reason, gone way down in this match list and tried to pursue some of that as well. But so far, I just haven't been able to get any real progress, which is extremely unusual for me. There have been a couple of people that have been willing to help that are much further down on the match list. So it hasn't been, you know, slam doors in my face every single time, but the ones that I really need the assistance for, from are the ones that have not been willing to give it. And the detective and his team have been incredibly proactive and following up on uh, things that I'm asking for. I don't know. I just know that the family trees go back to Texas, Tennessee, Alabama, primarily, but we which that's where remember guys remember the graphic earlier where it was talking about from the the water in the bones that they could tell where she was from. And that was that big highlighted uh, region. No, there was the great migration from the south up into uh, St. Louis, Detroit, Chicago. And so it's very possible that her more immediate family did move to the area. I mean, I know that, that uh, there is some opinion that she wasn't from St. Louis. I'm not totally sure about that. I mean, I know she has deep roots in the South, but I don't, I wouldn't rule out that she may have been growing up in St. Louis and have family there still. Here we go, listen up guys, everybody. If, and by the way, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks for hanging out. Um, I'm so glad to start doing these true crime uh, reactions and true crime videos like this. Um, because watch, I bet right here, we're going to be able to figure out how we can help. Shout out. It's Ed Rar. Ed Rar. Don't feel bad. Don't get mad because I mispronounce everybody's names. But Ed Ra, right? The director of the documentary in the chat as well. I'm doing true crime, so I'm supposed to say allegedly. Just kidding. <laughs> but hey, thanks so much for popping in, man. Thanks for coming in. Let's see. I just think it's really important for the public to know that the detective and his team on this case are working very hard. They are very invested in giving this little girl her identity back and letting her family know what happened. And so I don't want anyone to think that there is a lack of effort here or a lack of care, because it just isn't true. There is a group of us that, that is working tirelessly to try to bring her identity back. Wow. Oh, this is one of the questions we brought up in the first part because we were like, okay, how would this person know like where to go? Like that that place was open. Shout out Sass. Thank you so much. $5. New Zealand going to put some flowers, put something, do something for this little girl. Thank you for that. Could be, yeah, coming down the alley, we probably picked that building. Oh, that's possible too. Yeah, the janitors used to live in the basement of all those buildings. Well, that's the first thing I was checking for was the old city registries we had a list of people who lived everywhere. And janitors usually were listed, and there were phone numbers, which are useless now, but names you can kind of so i went back like 10 years of those 
the history of that building and research everybody that lived in it. A, for the names that I'm looking for, and B, just to run the record checks and all that, but that's a rat hole that you can never get out of once you start. I hesitate to even say there are leads. What I can tell you is there's a mystery of who this child is. And every time you start to unwrap or peel off a layer, the only thing you uncover is another mystery. If that makes any sense. You know, you sadly it does make sense. You get a surname or investigate, you peel that off and oh my lord, you get mystery after mystery after mystery. You thank him, you know, and thanks for your time and everything, you know, and uh, keep, if you think of anything else, call us, you know, you, you got to keep an open mind. I can tell you, I don't know who they, who they dealt with in the past or who they dealt with now that I wouldn't know about, but we'll take any help we can get, especially if it's free. Well. Wow. Well, of course. The guys that followed up on it, they were, they were very, you know, they gave you a lot of courtesy. They'd call and ask questions or things like that. They'd always tell me what was going on, you know, even though you're not there anymore. I still contact uh, Colonel Adkins and see how he's doing and tell him, tell him say, oh, I guess say he, he ran into another one of the lieutenant was in charge down there and he we were somewhere and he asked him how's my case going <laughs> he never forgot <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he said he used, to, he used to wake up in cold sweats you know thinking about dead case yeah yeah this is the one yeah this came up in the first part too a little bit earlier that for somebody to not come forward for somebody to not have um reported somebody missing or the parents or guardian or something like that involves. You don't know. It could be, you know, you know, you, you, don't, you don't want to put all your, you got to keep an open mind. It could be a complete stranger too. You don't know. You know. I guess that's true. That's crazy. They interviewed the green river killer as a suspect before he was known as a serial killer. Wow. This is a case that, as bad as it is, theories aside, when the truth comes out, it's going to be worse. I really Sadly. do think the investigators, you know, did as much as they could. You know, you can say what you want about the St. Louis Police Department these days. I really do feel like the people involved in this case did the work that they had to do and the work that they could do at the time. And unfortunately, it just never panned out with that key piece of evidence, you know? That's pretty sad. Well, the first order of business was to collect, A, collect everything we had available still in the office, put it in some kind of order, and then we had it digitized. The FBI helped us with that. Now we sent everything we had out to Quantico. It was yes. all digitized. And now we have a digital version of what we have. And I wonder how long that took. Can you imagine how long that would take to go through all those case files and digitize everything? We don't have to keep bothering. Some of those papers are getting brown and crumbly. And obviously some have disappeared or disintegrated over the years. Or got lost in the mail. Here's so at least we've got preserved what we have, and that's what we're moving forward with from this point. That's a uh, small office with everything that was ever gathered by the police department other than laboratory stuff that was digitized. We just put it in there in a central location and kind of like a memorial to her until somebody give her a name and pull that down and put all that stuff in stories where it needs to be and stop looking at it. 
but that was another way to keep people from it's obviously locked. So, so now nobody's ever going to have to, I'm not going to be around forever. Um, and I didn't want the next guy to have to spend a couple of years sifting through papers and put them in some kind of order. So that's basically what it is, a file them for her. Wow. But in our, in our, uh, in our little office there, we got a name for it. Jane Doe number one, 1983. So that's, but if people, if they know that they had a friend or a cousin or somebody that's missing that may be related to them or they know somebody they think it's related to, they can just do that 23andMe or Ancestry.com, put it in there, leave it open so it can be compared to the stuff that is floating around out there. That kind of stuff is what's going to solve this case. Oh, I see what you're saying. That's what you meant is that if you check that box, it won't be, but if you leave it off, then it will be. Gotcha. The horrifying elements of the crime are what stick with you. She was found uh, nude from the waist down. Uh, she, her, her arms were tied behind her with red uh, nylon cords and her, she was wearing a yellow sweater and she was missing her head. We'd like to find out who she is, you know, find who did that to her and, and, and get with the family. Let them know that, you know, we never forgot them. We, we did the best we could, but uh, we're, we're not afraid to pray either. Do you know me? Wow. Well, there you go. Oh my goodness. Hey, look, there he goes. It won't hide that though. Pause, hide. There you go. Hey! Hey! It checks out. Hey, once again, guys, make sure go show the original documentary all the love it deserves link is in the description thanks for watching thanks for hanging out with me guys two parts two go back rewatch the first part if you didn't watch it if you haven't seen it um but wow i mean just like we talked about earlier guys just unbelievably tragic story um uh Seth, i think you just said like it must haunt it must haunt like everybody that worked the case like it must work everybody must just be like okay <laughs> like I, I, how can this not be solved already even like the lady was talking about she's like oh i should be able to solve this in a week the genealogy lady i should be able to solve this in a week it should be no problem and still still not um still not be able to solve it wow Mm. Mm -mm -mm. so what do you guys think more more like this keep doing the true crime reactions i'm gonna let the credits play guys because it's just the right thing to do look there he is wow yeah no i'm uh i'm uh I'm glad this was the I'm glad this was the first one too, guys, because like I said, that was very well put together. It was very, very so much detail. So much detail went into that. And make sure you guys hit the like button. Make sure you go click the links. Guys, all the links are in the description. Go down, watch the original documentary. Um the Reddit link where I found this case is in there the wikipedia link is in there all that is in there 
Katani is saying, thank you, Bird, for being so thorough. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yes, really like this. Good. Me too. Me too. All right, you guys. Looks like that is the end of this one. Um, don't worry. Another live stream very, very soon. Uh, I might even do one tomorrow. Who knows? Uh, Tuesday night live streams for sure. Thursday night live streams for sure. And brand new episodes of The Haunted Side every single Friday. All right, you guys. We'll take care. Oop. Take care. Be safe. I appreciate you guys. I'll see you soon. Have a wonderful day, night, evening, whatever it is where you are. I'll see you guys soon. Thank you much.